feel like that's the kind of introduction that's better at the end. So if this goes bad, then I feel built up. But right now I feel a little bit uh, uh, like there's some pressure for me to do well after that. So but thank you for Scott. I do love him and, and his family and the uh, work we get to do together from time to time. I want to start by saying thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, my name's Matt again. Uh, my wife Madison is here taking Shiloh to class, I think. There she is. Uh, Shiloh will turn five on Saturday, and so if you see her, you can tell her happy birthday, and she'll think she's a pretty big deal if everybody knows that it's her birthday coming up. Uh, I preach at BB. As Scott said, I have been there since 2010. I was youth minister for five years, and then I've been preaching now for four years. Uh, and it is my first time, I believe, to speak at Highway, so I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, from Devin, who uh, invited me to come tonight. How many of you guys like shopping for bargains? You see a show of hands. Yeah. Uh, if you're from Arkansas, you almost have to enjoy it or be good at it with all of the flea markets and the sale bar barns and you know, the yard sales that are going on all the time. Uh, either you're good at f uh, finding deals or you know somebody who is good at finding deals. People who love getting deals will do whatever it takes to get a deal. You might know some of these people who if they're in a store and the can of peas is 20 cents more expensive than it is at the store five miles down the road, then they'll leave that store and drive that five miles to get that can of peas at 20 cents cheaper than the store that they're in there. Never mind that they'll spend, you know, so much money in gas getting there and so much extra time. It's the principle of the thing, right? Getting the best bargain. Some people love pilfering through yard sale tables for hours upon hours trying to find some great life-changing deal. And these people typically don't know what they're looking for when they are looking for something. But once they find it, then they'll know what it was that they were looking for. Some people love scrolling through internet yard sale sites or eBay or sites like those trying to find a deal of a lifetime. And what we're doing when we hunt for these bargains is obvious. We are trying to come out on top, right? We want to pay as little as possible and get as much as possible. We want to win. Now some of you may in fact be pretty good at finding deals and making deals and you can most of the time come out on top at these places, but uh, not me. I have not yet mastered the art of deal finding and deal making. I'll tell one story when I was young. I, mem I remember my older sister roped me into this uh, CD company. Now some of you may have fallen prey to this yourself. But there's this CD company that was offering these fantastic deals on CDs where you could get these CDs for like six dollars a piece and you, all you had to do was sign a contract for like two years and within those two years you had to buy something like two dozen CDs. And sometimes you'd get CDs for free from them or if you know they had a sale if you bought two you'd get one free or something like that. And it all sounds like a fantastic deal. What I didn't know was that that company over those two years was going to eat me alive and swallow up all of my allowance from my parents that I had. Because by the time, even if I got the CD for free or very cheap, by the time I got done paying for shipping and handling uh, and taxes, I had paid more than I would have if I just went and bought the CD for full, full price at the music store. Sometimes deals come back to bite us. And we all know what it is to find a great deal, but I think we also know what it is to think that we found a great deal, only to be bitten by the deal that we thought we had. Well, bargain hunting turns out not to be all that new of a thing. It's not, after all, a 21st century Arkansas thing but it was around even in the first century where people did not just look for bargains at yard sales and flea markets and sale barns, but also within the Lord's church. And so tonight I want to invite you to turn over to the book of Acts in chapter 5. And our subject tonight is Ananias and Sapphira and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5, and we're going to begin in verse 1.
But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. In verse 7, After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. The story of Ananias and Sapphira shocks us awake like touching an electric wire that we thought was dead. It's a pretty unsettling story for a few different reasons. First of all, it's unsettling and upsetting in the narrative flow of the book of Acts. Up to this point, there's not a whole lot that might prepare us for this jarring of a story. And so in chapter 1, Jesus begins the conversation on the Holy Spirit. And he makes this promise that the Spirit would come upon the apostles to empower them in their ministry. And so at the very beginning, there's this healthy, positive expectation and anticipation of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit then in chapter 2 falls on the apostles and they speak in tongues and Peter delivers this home run sermon and 3,000 people are baptized and added to the Lord's church. The only resistance that comes up to this point in the book of Acts comes from outside of the church. When Peter in chapter 3 is at the temple gate and heals the lame man there, it's the Jewish authorities who push back. And of course, after we've read the gospel accounts of Jesus' ministry, this should not surprise us. Of course, the Jewish authorities are not going to like what the apostles are doing and continuing this ministry uh, that Jesus had begun. And yet, the Holy Spirit continues to empower the church and to embolden them to speak about Jesus. You know, having the Spirit empowering the church, at least when I read the book of Acts, feels like LeBron James is on your team, right? Um, as long as we, the church, sort of just play our supporting roles, kind of do okay, you know, LeBron's going to carry the heavy weight, right? He's going to make sure that the job gets done. And that's what it feels like to have the Spirit on our side. What could possibly go wrong? And then chapter 5 comes, and Ananias and Sapphira are struck dead by God because they lie to the Holy Spirit. Now, we expected trouble to come on the church from the outside, but from the inside and from God himself afflicting the church. You know, another reason that this story is upsetting to us is not only that it's upsetting in the narrative flow of the book of Acts, but uh, because of how some of us characterize the Old Testament versus the New Testament. If we're pretty familiar with some stories in the Old Testament, then this may sound like the kind of story that we might read there in that First Testament where God punishes his people from time to time. And so, for example, we could go back and look at the story of Adam and Eve and draw parallels there. Here's another man and woman who disobey God and they pay the punishment of death for their rebellion against God. Or we have the story, of course, in Leviticus chapter 10 of Nadab and Abihu who offer this unauthorized fire before the Lord and they're consumed by the Lord. The strongest connection between Acts 5 and the Old Testament, though, is a story that is told to us in Joshua chapter 7. It's the story of Achan. And the people, of course, if you remember that story in Joshua 7, were not to keep any of the devoted things from their victory 
Achan, of course, thinks he can get away with it. He keeps some. And then the anger of the Lord burns against the people of Israel. And the next day, the Lord speaks to Joshua and tells Joshua that until those devoted things that were supposed to be destroyed are destroyed, the Lord will no longer be with and go out with his people. And so the next day, Joshua brings all the people out and whittles the people down from all of Israel down to Achan and his household. And then the people take Achan and his family and even his livestock, it says there in chapter 7 of Joshua, and they stone them to death. All of these stories resonate with this story in Acts 5, but the problem is these are stories in the Old Testament. And we're okay with these kind of stories, or we're somewhat okay with these stories being in the Old Testament, because if they're in the Old Testament, we can kind of keep them out of sight and out of mind. Right? There's a lot of ugly stories in the Old Testament, difficult and embarrassing stories in the Old Testament. But as long as they stay in the Old Testament... <laughs> We're okay, or somewhat okay, with these stories being in the Bible. And sometimes we characterize the God of the Old Testament as having little to do with the God of the New Testament. And in fact, Christians as early as Marcion have claimed that there's actually two gods. There's, or at least the Old Testament God is not the God of the New Testament. And yet the story of Ananias and Sapphira disrupts those neat categories and systems like hot coffee in the lap. And what's more, after this story in Acts chapter 5, is this is not the only story in the book of Acts that is a judgment story of God to his people. So we have the story in Acts chapter 8, Simon Magus. If I'm saying Magus right, you may say Magus or something. Simon's a magician. He wants to buy from the apostles the ability to give the Holy Spirit to, to whomever he wants, whoever, whomever he lays hands upon. And Peter tells this man in verse 20 and following, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours. Pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity." Simon Magus is on the verge of hell because he thought he could buy this gift of the Spirit, this power from the apostles. The story of Herod in chapter 12, verse 20 to 23, who does not give glory to God, and he's struck down. And then very grotesquely, we're told that he's eaten by worms. <laughs> it's a nice detail. Story of Elymas, or Bar-Jesus, who tried to turn the proconsul Sergius Paulus, away from the faith. Paul says to him, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Sorry, this is in Acts 13, 9-11. You're full of deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and, will be, and you will be blind and, and unable to see the sun for a time. And immediately, Luke tells us, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Elymas is struck blind because he was opposing the church. And then the last story that I want to call attention to in Acts is in Acts chapter 19 with the seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Sceva, who thought that the name of Jesus just in and of itself had some sort of magical powers, that you could just invoke this name, and voila, like you were you know, invoking some other powerful name and that would work in exorcisms. But Luke tells us when they try this, the evil spirit answers them. This is a really eerie kind of passage. The, the spirit speaks to them. Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. It's not surprising that after many of these stories, Luke tells us something like what he tells us after the story of Ananias and Sapphira in verse 13 of chapter 5, none of the rest dared to join them. Interesting way to describe the church. There is a respectful fear from the general populace toward the community of God's people. Luke's depiction of the God of the church is frighteningly close to the God of the Old Testament. 
so much so that we have to concede, after all, that this is the one and same God. I think Luke would warn, warn us that God in our midst is not a safe God. Uh, Shiloh, who I just mentioned a second ago, uh, has a toy uh, kitchen set in her playroom. Uh, kitchen set like many of you probably had for your kids, your kids have. And it's nice because she can go in there and it's, you know, plastic and has rounded edges and it's soft and cute and uh, she can make us, you know, all kinds of things like uh, chocolate eggs. Sometimes she'll make that for some reason. Uh, pizza and burgers and things on that thing. And we love it and we, you know, she can be in there by herself and playing and having a good time. We don't have to watch her, that kind of thing. But then there are stoves and ovens, our real ones, in our homes which are pretty nice luxuries to have in our homes, right? Pretty convenient to have, uh, you know, the ability to cook hot food there and, and what a blessing for us to have stoves and ovens that we can use. We don't always think about how dangerous those are. And yet we know intuitively that they are. That we don't leave our stoves on while we go on vacation. We don't casually rest against the stove after we've been just cooking on it. We don't let kids play around the stove when there's hot grease on top of it. We know that these are dangerous things right in the midst of our living spaces. They're wonderful luxuries to have, but we're fools if we treat the real thing like a toy one. And we're fools if we don't have a healthy and fearful awareness of really how dangerous ovens and stoves can be. God fills His people with the Spirit and while the Spirit brings peace and comfort to the church, of course it does, He can also bring affliction. The Spirit is no mere plaything. Spirit fills the church with power and boldness and knowledge. But the Spirit that fills the church is God Himself. And God is not some thing that we can just use to our own advantage. I think sometimes we do prefer the plaything, though, to the real thing, or at least we expect that. If I mention that I'm going to be giving a class or a series on the Holy Spirit, then I bet some of us at least expect a positive and encouraging Caleb kind of message, right, with the Spirit. Don't we expect me to talk about things like freedom and peace and love and these fruits of the Spirit? And yes, we can and we should talk about those things. We have to. But woe to us if we forget the danger at hand with God in our midst. For those of us who grew up hearing this story about Ananias and Sapphira, we associate dread with those names, right? All I have to say is Acts chapter 5, and if you know where the story is, then you just kind of know, okay, we're kind of talking about some touchy stuff tonight. Ananias and Sapphira, if I just say those names, then we know that here's two phonies that got busted. Have you ever thought about, however, what a good thing it was that Ananias and Sapphira did? Ananias and Sapphira took a piece of their property and they went to the trouble of selling a piece of their property and giving that money to people in the church who had need. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands like I did with the bargain hunting question, but how, I wonder how many of you have done that? How many of us have ever seen a need in the church and went and sold an expensive piece of our property, something that we owned, in order to meet that need, instead of just giving the excess out of our wallet that happened to be handy that day? How many of us have dug as deeply as Ananias and Sapphira? So I first want to cut Ananias and Sapphira a little bit of slack because I think they've done something that not many people in our churches have done. These are the sort of people whom we usually name buildings after, streets after, and awards after. And yet still, of course, for all that they did, they still went wrong. And I'd like to explore just for a few minutes where it was that we think they went wrong. So I first want to think about what the problem was not, because I think sometimes we read this story too quickly and we miss what the real problem was that ended up bringing about their own deaths. First, the problem was not that Ananias and Sapphira had land or that they had possessions. Verse 1 tells us that they sold a piece of property, and so it's very likely that they had 
uh, more than one piece of property to their name, just as many of you may have more than one piece of property to your name or have rent houses or that kind of thing. But Luke does not tell us that it was wrong in and of itself that they had property to begin with. I also think it needs to be said that there was no obligation for them to give. They did not have to give this land. Uh, and that's clear from what Peter says to Ananias in verse 4. This was your property to do with what you wanted before and after you sold it. There was no requirement for early Christians in the church to sell all of their possessions. Christians then and Christians now are not coerced into giving. Giving is voluntary and not mandatory. And so the problem is not, I believe, that they had possessions. The problem is not even that they retained some of their possessions and didn't sell all of them. And I also think this, and I, I, I hear this taught more times than not, I believe the problem also was not that they kept back some of the proceeds of what they sold and did not give all of it to the apostles. And I think verse 4 seems to make that pretty clear, that the money, even the money that they got from selling the land, was theirs at their disposal even after they sold it. If they had sold the property, if they had been honest with Peter about, here's how much we sold the property for, but we're only going to give this much of it, I'm not so sure there would have been a problem. So what was the problem? I think there are several layers to this problem, several ways that we could tackle it. I think first it does need to be say, uh, said that this story, the problem, uh, involves stuff. Stuff, material stuff. They sell stuff A for stuff B and they give some of stuff B to the apostles. I think greed for stuff may very well have been part of the problem here. We need to be careful how we use the stuff that we have. And so Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.10, The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and God will judge us uh, sooner or later on how we use our stuff. And so greed may factor in here to some degree. But again, I think the problem is not that Ananias and Sapphira had stuff and kept stuff. I think the real problem, from what I can tell from the text, is that they lied to the apostles about what they sold the field for. Ananias and Sapphira agreed to make out as if they brought to the apostles 100% of what they got the property for to look as though they were being more generous than they were being. And so to back up this claim, uh, I think Luke emphasizes this collusion and lying here as the great sin of this story. So notice in verse 2, Ananias, it says, with his wife's knowledge. There's collusion here keeps back some of the proceeds. Verse 3, Peter says Ananias has lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 again tells us that Ananias could have done whatever he wanted to do with this stuff and that he lied to God. And then most telling of all, I think, is the question that Peter asks Sapphira in verse 8. Was this the amount that you sold the land for? What's in question, I think, in this story is the price that they sold the land for and the amount that they brought to the apostles. Now that's the surface of the problem, uh, lying to the apostles, but I think there's an even deeper way that we can describe their fault. Another way to get at their sin is that they were bargain hunting in the Lord's church. Now uh, be relieved that bargain hunting is not a sin in flea markets and sale barns and yard sales and those sorts of things, but in the church I think it is. Ananias and Sapphira were bargain hunting in the church. Now, what do I mean by that? Remember what I said when we talked about what bargain hunting was. We are trying to come out on top, right? We want to pay as little as possible and get as much as possible. We want to win. And so to illustrate this, uh, I've reappropriated some categories that Bonhoeffer made there you go. That can just stay up there. I'm a one slide kind of guy, so I don't put a lot of time into my PowerPoint presentation. So this is the one slide y'all get tonight with the lesson. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as you may know, uh, talked about cheap and costly grace. And I like to talk about cheap and costly community. Ananias and Sapphira were after cheap community. And cheap community is community that costs little to nothing. Ananias and Sapphira tried to be part of the church 
without really being part of the church. They wanted to come out on top. They wanted to get all of the benefits of being part of the church while paying as little as possible. Have we ever said, we're part of this community without really being part of this community? Do we ever say, I'm part of this church family without really being part of the church family? And so we say, my name's on the log, my picture's in the directory. You just ask anybody, right, that knows where I go to church and they'll tell you exactly where I go to church. This is where I go to church and everybody and their brother knows it. And yet, is it cheap or costly community that we're part of? Are we part of this community because we've got some ink on a page in the directory? Are we part of the community because we've got blood, sweat, and tears in the work and relationship of the church? Those whose church community is cheap, as we know, don't usually show up on Saturdays to work. They don't usually volunteer their time to do difficult things outside of their comfort zones. They don't typically like it when other people try to hold them accountable for lifestyle choices that they're making. But if you're looking for real community, real community as opposed to phony community, it will cost you. Costly community demands something from us. Costly community takes time and work and effort and money. Now you may not have noticed this before, but the story of Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5 is actually intentionally paired with the story that comes right before it at the end of chapter 4. So if you look back at chapter 4, 34, and actually in chapter 5, verse 1, your chapter probably begins with the word but. Uh, maybe and, but, but I think is a better word. There's a link between the story of Ananias and Sapphira and what comes before and this is what we're told in that passage. There is not a needy person among them. This is a, a picture of the church of those days. As many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, brought them the proceeds of what was sold, laid it at the apostles' feet. It was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Barnabas exhibits for us costly community. And so I don't think it's a coincidence that Barnabas continues to show up from time to time in the book of Acts, doesn't he? He's there for the long haul. Whereas Ananias and Sapphira come and go in just a few short verses. And it makes me think, isn't that how it typically goes? People who are looking for a church to serve them and meet their needs. Many of them are here for a little time, and they're not here for long. But it's those who see this as a costly community that know that demands work. It takes work. It takes effort. It's those people who are here for a longer time. Costly community. And again, no one's under compulsion to give. Not then, not now. It's voluntary, not mandatory. And yet, it does still cost. How does your community cost you here at Highway? I could ask that question for us at BB as well. But how does the community here cost you? Does it cost you? For example, I'll just throw out some, some pretty practical examples here. What about the prayer list? Now, we all like for our name to be on the prayer list. If we're going through something or we have a family member going through something, we want people to pray for us. But do we take the time and make the effort to pray for the people on the prayer list? Do we save the bulletin and make sure that we pray for those people throughout the week? Or do we just want our name on the prayer list? We want someone to bring meals to our house if we're going through something very difficult, if we've had a loss or a surgery. But do we bring meals to others? Do we give money so that others can provide meals for other people who are going through hard times? We look to others to include us in their friend groups who go out and socialize and we feel uh, a little put off when we are not invited to everything that these other groups of friends are doing. 
And yet, do we make the effort to reach out to those people on the margins of the church and include them? Sadly, I think that there's a lot of people who, when looking for a church to be part of, are really just looking for a bargain. And sadly, I think some people never understand why church feels so cheap to them. So, rounding third here and heading for home, I've got my last two pages of notes here, and then I think we're probably going to be done. Don't quote me on that, but maybe done a few minutes early. Round third here and head for home, I think that there's an even deeper problem here in this story. I think the greatest mistake that Ananias and Sapphira make is that they fail to discern God in this people. They see this people as just any other group of people. Now, of course, there's this group, right, that you can be part of, and they're over here, and their meeting days are here, and they meet over here at this address, and there's that group of people that meet here at these times, and they do these things. But then there's this group, they meet on Sundays typically, and they're called the church, and they do these sorts of things, but they're just sort of another group of people, like any other group of people that you can be part of. But Ananias and Sapphira failed to realize that this, in fact, is not just a group like any other group. This is a group unlike any group because this is a group with God among them. This is a group filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira failed to see God in the midst of this people. And again, I want to cut them a little bit of slack because it's kind of hard to blame them sometimes, right? Right? You know, when you've been part of a church for several years, now if you're in the honeymoon stage and you just started going to church somewhere, everything seems great, hopefully, and people just seem all kind and everything's great and dapper, dandy. But the longer you've been around a church, the more you get to really know people. And you get sort of disillusioned sometimes that there's anything really special about this group of people. And so maybe it's this guy and this girl that you know in the church and you think... Um, I was there when they, their marriage fell apart. I was there when their family fell apart. I know the mistakes made on both sides, and they're just broken people. Or this person who comes to church here, I know, I know what they're really doing. They're just politicking and networking for the sake of their business. They're trying to build up contacts. That's why they're here at church. They're just people. Or I know the shepherds and the leaders here, and... Man, they've just dropped the ball a few times over the last several years. I thought they should have made a decision going this way. They ended up going another way. They've really let me down. And they just are people. And in fact, there's people in the community who I've heard from the, through the grapevine who say that a lot of the people that go to church here or there are just a bunch of hypocrites. And you know, if I'm being kind of generous, I can kind of see where they're coming from. It can appear at times as though there isn't anything different about this group of people from other groups of people that we know. And in fact, sometimes I think we can begin to prefer other groups of people, even to the church. Where we prefer to spend time with our golfing buddies, our fishing buddies, quilting partners, people that we work with, maybe just our own nuclear family. We just think, okay, let's just have us time and not really do much with the church. And we begin to prefer our little groups outside of the church. I think it can be easy to fail to discern God in the midst of the church. And at times it can be easy to look around and see just people. It's easy to fail to discern God, I think, at times in our lives, but what Acts 5 teaches us is that that failure can prove to be costly. You know, when it comes to bargain hunting... Like I said, I'm not very good at making bargains, so maybe this is why I've, I've stuck with this uh, little advice that I've come to know. And that is that you usually get what you pay for. And if you pay cheaply, then more than likely you will get something cheap. And if it costs you, then it's usually worth it. Judge carefully. If you fail to see God here, and I'm talking about here at Highway, or here at BB, or wherever you worship, if you don't worship here. If you fail to see God here, be careful lest you be burned. 
we get what we pay for, are we willing to pay? Are we willing to work? Are we willing to give, to sacrifice? What is this community? Brothers and sisters, by your sides, in front of you and behind you, what are these people worth to you? And as I close, let me ask, what was it worth to God? Not just the church universal, but the church here at Highway. What was the church worth to God? Did God pay as little as He possibly could to secure this bargain? Did He look at us and say, "Ah, oh, they must not cost very much. I bet I can get them at a pretty low price. I bet I can engage with them minimally. I bet I can pay minimally. I bet I can get a deal on these people. Of course not. He saw us, His church, as His bride, bride of His Son, and yes, again, even this group that meets at BB, sorry, Highway, <laughs> meets at Highway, I'm so used to saying BB, and He's paid more for us than we were worth. He paid the price of His Son. In fact, Acts 20, 28 probably says it the strongest of any place that I know of in the Bible, where Paul tells us, God obtained the church, God obtained the church with His own blood. This community cost God all that he had. No wonder he won't tolerate us treating it cheaply. What is this community worth to you? Let's close in a prayer. Dear God, we're so grateful to be part of the church. We're so grateful for the gift of your spirit. And we do know that that spirit is strength and peace and comfort and a spirit who is uh, the presence of God in each of us and in our brothers and sisters in the community of the church. And what a blessing to, to have your spirit among us. But Lord, I also pray that you would awaken us from the times that we try to cut corners from our communities where we try to do as little as possible and engage as, as little as possible, have as much left over for ourselves so that we can come out on top, that we could find a community that serves us and meets our needs and, and yet really contribute little in return. Lord, for the times that I've failed in this sin, I pray for your forgiveness and I pray for forgiveness for all of us. Where we look at your church that you paid for with your own blood, and try to make a bargain with your people. Lord, forgive us of this sin. Turn our hearts back to you and to one another. Fill us with your Spirit and bless us and help us like you, your Son, to value your people so much that we would pour out our own lives for each other, that it would cost us everything. And through that, may we come to see of what beautiful worth the church is. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Is that it? Are we done?